Hello and welcome to In the Light, Growing Your Soul with me, Anna Isabel. And I'm so excited because I have somebody unusual and special with me today. And um, he has worked in various aspects of entertainment from street theater to, well, corporate entertainment. But it seems that his claim to fame may have been unexpected for him. Um, it is this amazing YouTube channel. It is Richard Vobes. And Richard, it's, I guess the first thing I want to say is you, you've gone from being this wonderful entertainer to a vet, almost like a, a, a different calling where you've ended up hosting what appears to be a focus for everyone who's concerned about freedom. What do you feel about that journey? Well, completely unexpected, really, uh, that side of it, the side that I'm in at the moment, very unexpected. Um, I was quite happy running the YouTube channel for the last five and a half years, six years now, I suppose, just going around the countryside, looking at heritage, landscape and nature things which in and of themselves is, I suppose, quite spiritual. You have a connection when you walk into an ancient building and especially a church or something like that, whether you're religious or not, and you you realise that this has been the hub of a community. People have come in, they've, um, they've, they've wept, they've laughed, they've shown joy, they've shown sorrow, they've been seriously trying to deal with problems, um, they've praise to their God, etc. Um, same with many houses and 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 sacred sor forests and places like that. But um, so in and of itself, I suppose I was um, in the footsteps of others in spiritual ways, not thinking that I would have this calling to seek out the truth, if you like, um, and the light. I think that's the thing, isn't it? And it's one of the reasons why I wanted to invite you on to, to discuss this because all of my guests up until now have been talking about their work in different aspects of the spiritual realm, <laughs> realm, <laughs> spirituality, exploring different aspects of spirituality, but in a very focused way. So they might be mediums, they might have been, um, written books about religion it's it's been a very focused thing but with you watching you I sense that actually this journey you're on is a very similar one to that of most people where we're just trying to figure life out and then something happens and it's like a, a light bulb goes on and then another light bulb goes on Yes, well, um, I seem to have flashing lights going on then in that case, because sometimes you feel like, oh, is that intuition coming from somewhere? Um, or is that just me coming up with a, an idea or a gut feeling that I should do such and such or I should carry on in this direction? And then other times, you know, you just know that's what you should do. And other times you're questioning going, oh, I don't know. Uh, now I'm in a quandary. Should I do this? Should I do not? And um, I'm certainly trying to work out what life is. I mean, as you get older, I think that's um, a fairly natural thing because you have a little bit more time. You've been around. You start to see patterns, especially if you've got kids. You see, oh, yes, I was a bit like that or I wasn't like that. And so you, you do start to think, oh, what's it all about? <laughs> I have no idea, really. Um, and, uh, you know, waiting, I suppose in one way, you're waiting for someone to tap you on the shoulder and say, this is what it's about. And, and in some ways you, you go looking for it. And, and sometimes you get those answers. If you listen to certain people, certain gurus, certain teachers, and then other times you go, oh, I don't know. I don't know whether that's really me. So yeah, light bulbs. Just exactly. And, and you were talking about intuition and I was just thinking about the some of the things that I've heard you talk about in terms of your early career so being a street performer and being an extra um 
all of this to me speaks of someone who is very independent, very free, and who is actually pretty uncompromising as to his individuality and his freedom. And I, I always feel with life that nothing's wasted. And I'm thinking about the, those, those days in your life and thinking, huh, that really, I think, prepared you for what you're doing now. Yes, I do think that um, all the different things that I have done in the past have been part of this preparation for now. But even now... I think what I'm doing is obviously prepar preparing me for something else because I feel that this is this isn't it, as it were, what I'm doing now, and and in many ways, and this, if any of my viewers are watching this, they may be slightly concerned because I feel that it is soon time to move from from what I'm doing, which is talking about the issues, to actually getting on and doing the issues, and I do find that I get. Um, frustrated if I can't move on or the people around me don't move on and that's certainly the case at the moment with the with the general public I suppose is that you're you're banging out these ideas and suggestions and coming up with solutions and people are just nodding and going yeah great and and I feel like going well go on then <laughs> get on with it so if they won't I'll have to I think you know we there's always the danger with conviction is that we can stray into evangelizing and hoping that everyone will see the light. And my feeling is actually, you know, we have to live what we believe. Mm. And those who are who think it's a good idea but are too afraid will think, ah, look, that's possible. So, and and I think that that will be true for a number of people. Others are in a state of learned helplessness. And learned helplessness is actually was a, a term that was coined in dog behaviorism, where they we're looking at dogs who had been very badly abused and who had shut down completely. And they were giving them very simple puzzles to do for them to be able to, to eat. And the dogs just wouldn't even move from where they were. So they brought in other dogs who were adjusted, well-adjusted dogs, and the dogs performed in front of the other dogs and got what they needed but the other dogs still couldn't move. They still oh. couldn't do it. They didn't think, ah, oh, that dog could do it, so I could, could do it. Because they'd gone into a, a way of thinking that was, well, they can, but I won't be allowed to. I, that's not gonna, it won't be me. So they, this is where the idea of learned helplessness comes from. And I look around, and there's a lot of people who are in a state of learned helplessness and actually don't even know it. You know, it's that thing about opening the the uh, cage door and the bird is too afraid to fly out. But I think you and your interviews have been absolutely brilliant at opening up the possibilities. So... For, don't for a moment think that just because there doesn't appear to be a mad rush of a crowd moving in that direction that it, you've not had an impact because just to give people the options and you'd be surprised at how many people are doing or following some of the ideas and suggestions that you've presented because I think that we're all on our own journey. So never underestimate your power. Well, thank you very much. I'll try I'll try not to, but uh, I, I suppose one of the things when you do something like run a YouTube channel, um, and, and you'll know this doing yours, is that you're recording 
on your own, looking at a camera or a laptop or whatever is recording the uh, the podcast, and uh, there's nobody there, and then you bung it up, it uploads, and you you know that you can see some of the comments, but you're working on other things, so a lot of the time you don't really see the impact of it. Now, by going out and doing talks that I have been asked, I suppose from June last year onwards, um, was really good because you're there with the crowd. Now, I've never been one who's been too frightened to stand up in front of the crowd because of my entertaining background. I always have something to fall back on, um, which might just break the ice and make people laugh. So then you w w won them over, hopefully, and then you can talk to them more earnestly. But when you've got them in front of you and they're con and there's nobody else, they can't just sort of go, oh, that's boring, I'll scroll on to something else. They've got to either get up and walk out, which is quite a big thing for people to do, or hopefully they're enjoying it. So they're sitting through and, and contemplating what you're saying, maybe disagreeing with what you're saying, which is perfectly fine. Um, uh, and possibly even agreeing with some of it, which was, which is nice or wants to talk to you. And then afterwards, then they come up and then they do talk and converse. And then that's when you know that you've, you've either, you know, made a good point or perhaps they've got nuances for you to think about uh, and and I love all that. And so that kind of interaction, I think, is great where you you do see the effect. But um, in the 2D world of um, flat screens and things, it's, you know, you just hope. And of course, I get emails and um, as, as well on top of that. And occasionally people sort of recognize me, which is very weird in the street. And they say, oh, you're uh, that YouTuber, aren't you, who, who spouts a load of old rubbish online? Say, yeah, that's me my sins um and uh, and so yeah i hope that you see mostly it's not me is it? it i mean i interview these wonderful guests it's it's giving them a platform uh to to express what they express but i'm learning from, i mean what makes it so fascinating is i'm learning from them and i hope that i'm just playing a member of the audience who's got the opportunity to ask idiotic questions when they talk about something so well, what, what, hang on a minute what does that actually mean oh i see what you mean okay so um yeah i mean i'm i'm i wouldn't uh i wouldn't say that that part of what i do is particularly special but um it is it has been very i've said I'm very honored to do it and and to have the respect that people want to come on the show and and take part that part is amazing well i think the one of the reasons why I love doing my my stuff is precisely because it's such an exciting way of learning mm. to have conversations. It's so enriching. Um, but I think with you, the the beauty of what you do as an interviewer, but also with your with your monologues, is that you are very much one of us there is that you are able to ask the questions that normal people who have never heard of common law or sovereignty or any of these other terms that are now very commonplace actually but if you're new to them what are they and you are really good at asking those questions um, so I, I think that it's it's not something that anyone can do. Just you, know, it's, it's it takes it takes a skill as well. Yeah. I no, think. I mean, I, I mean, I do. I accept. I accept it. I mean, it takes a. It, it, I think it does take a skill, um, and and many people can do that. Have that skill, whereas a lot of people are more skillful at, at millions of things that I can't possibly do because they've spent the time learning how to do it. So I think inevitably, if you sit in front of a camera asking people questions, you're going to get better and better at it. And of course, I've spent most of my life um, either filming or falling around, <laughs> making a fool of myself, um, as is my call it, calling. And um, I know you, you've, um, I think we've spoken about my birth chart or, or my star sign and things, so you'll know that there is an element of the performer in that 
And if I can use that to my advantage in terms of getting over important messages or sharing ideas so that people listen to them, even if only just to sort of weigh them up, I'm not asking people to necessarily agree with anything. It's just, you know, listen, have a listen to this idea. You might find it bonkers, but perhaps somewhere in all of that, there is a, a grain of um, a grain of gold or silver or whatever it is that's supposed to be in there. I don't know. Um, but hopefully, hopefully. Uh, and But the thing that I found with the monologue, sorry to go on, is I don't always know where they come from. And, and I go a bit like that because sometimes people will say, you know, you're on the money with that, Richard. You know, where did you get that idea? And I think, no, I have no idea. Then you start believing your own publicity, which is the worst thing that you can do, I think, is you start believing that actually you're receiving something from somewhere else. And then, and I've had these days, because I do them just for the sake of your viewers who, do, who, who won't know me, I do them every day. Uh, and so, you know, wake up some mornings and you're going, what the hell am I going to talk about today? I've, I've got no inspiration at all. And some days I go, well, that doesn't matter, it'll come. And it does. And it may be, it may be very good or it may be incredibly mediocre. But other days... I'm going, well, I'm supposed to be getting these downloads or inspiration or ideas or something will spark and nothing is happening. And so you go, oh, yeah, I'm not as clever as I thought I was. It's not always happening. Maybe it was all a fluke. And so you you go through this sort of up and down. Uh, have I got something of is there anything worthwhile that I'm going to say or, or add to it? And, and has any of it been worthwhile? You know, so you. I do go through all of that. Whereas some people who, who seem to be connected to source, the universe, God, whichever, um, they always seem to be perfectly in tune with themselves and, and all of that. But I'm quite I'm quite happy to say, no, I don't know one day to the next whether I'm in tune with anything or just just <laughs> have nothing to add to it. I'll, but I'll try. You know, the 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 thing is. I will try uh, rather than go, oh, I can't do it today. And and that just comes from being bloody minded, I think. Well, you know, what you're describing there is the creative process, isn't it? Sometimes we're inspired and sometimes we're not. Just this morning, I was thinking, hmm, am I writing a newsletter for March? What are we talking about? And then and yet at the start of uh, January and February, it was there. It was just there in my mind. And so I think this is the creative process sometimes we we feel inspired and it it feels like it just appears in in my head and and that's what you're describing too sometimes it feels like it appears like somebody's just popped this into your head sometimes i have the wording and everything um not specifically specifically for my newsletters but any other writing that i might be doing and then other times i i struggle and it's um I think there's something about what moves us. And maybe those days when you're feeling inspired are days when you've been moved by something. What do you think? Um, I guess, I mean, I guess so. I mean, sometimes I sort of get to the point where I go, well, is this an outside source or is it the inner self, a higher self? Or is it just what most people think who aren't spiritual at all and just think, well, it's just an idea, mate. You know, you just had an idea. That's all it is. You know, it's not anything to don't, uh, don't uh, get above your station and think you're ever so clever connected to the universe and all. it's just an idea. So um, I, you know, that that's the, where I am on my journey, I suppose, is that I have, I don't really know. And when I analyze things, it gets worse. You know, if I start to analyze oh. it, you know, it's like, oh, well, then, you know, don't analyze it. You've got to just go with your gut feeling. The thing I wanted to add to, to that, because I do this every day, I used to, um, before I did all my YouTube stuff, I used to write. Um, I tried to write children's books and I, I failed at that because I kept writing really for me. And they were far, the, the 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 stories were too involved. The language I was using was much more adult language, but it was all based around sort of kids having fun, really. And so I think grown-ups would enjoy them more than um, kids, but they're just not sellable. But the point I'm trying to get to was I would get up at five o'clock and I would sit and I would be, I'm quite disciplined, 
you see. So I can do that. I can get up and just sit and face a white screen and go da 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 da, da and type something and not know. And I would have my characters always in a, um, a a cliffhanger situation. And I wouldn't know how to get out of it when I finished that particular bit. So, you know, whatever it was, someone's on the edge of the cliff and they're about to be pushed off by the McNasty, whatever it was, you know. And I'll go, oh, blimey, how's he going to get out of that? Anyway, I'll leave that for the day. Then the next morning I come down and I'll go, oh, I know. Yeah, he'll um, he'll fall onto this ledge and there's just there's this and there's this. and and But I would it wouldn't be the obvious. It wouldn't be, oh, he would there's a tree or something something un unexpected have to happen so that the audience didn't the reader didn't get it and i had no problem doing that whereas you hear some writers saying oh i have a mental block i have writer's block I can't do it. and i never quite understood that because i would just write anything just even though i wouldn't know i would just write you know he's hanging on the edge of the cliff and i might go well i have no idea how he's going to do that so I would just go, just then it started raining. And then that might just trigger something. And you go, oh, and because the rain, the clay started to become sludgy and then it was it was more different, it was clawing, the, but, but the clay suddenly became useful to throw down and soften his landing. And suddenly I thought, oh, I've got some plausible thing that came from nowhere, but did it? <laughs> I don't know. So um, coming up with ideas has not ever been a problem for me generally. Well, you know, um, we do have in our culture the notion of the muse, uh, the this idea that inspiration it comes from somewhere else, and and I think that, you know, most of us who have these flashes of feeling like, oh, that that feels external because I couldn't have thought of this in a million years. Um, I think that we need to trust the fact that perhaps somebody did whisper in our ear. And... But does that make us make us pretty useless then? If we can't have the ideas that it's all coming from somewhere else, we're just a vessel for those ideas to come to us. It's like, what shall I do today? What is it? Uh, oh, yeah, good, thanks. Da -da 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 -da. Then I take all the credit for somebody else who's given it. You know, it's like, well, that's not tr I, that's not fair, I've, is it? I, I... Yeah, no, I've thought about that, actually. And I think I think if we take the notion of free will, then it means that we must be the authors of our own thoughts and actions for the most part. But that doesn't mean we don't get a helping hand from time to time. Sure. And I think, I think that that's the... Because... If we are to work with the idea that nobody's allowed to interfere with us because we have free will, then clearly most of it is going to be driven by us. But there are going to be those moments when there's a friendly, helpful suggestion that pops into our minds. And I think that it brings us to a certain extent to an element of faith because what is it that makes you, when you feel stuck, continue where somebody else might, as you say, go, oh, I've got writer's block. And I think there's an element here of, well, I'll think of something. I suppose if, I mean, just thinking about what you were saying there, if um, if, if, if you're sitting there and, and something is suggested to you, whether it's a voice in the head, whether it's just something that you see, you know, a black cat walks past and, and you go, oh, actually, that gives me an idea, whatever it is. You've got the choice to accept that or not. So, you know, some some higher self says to you, uh, there's a mattress at the end of the cliff and he lands on the mattress, you know, your hero in this book or whatever it is. And you go, oh, great. Yeah, I wouldn't have thought of that. Uh, but actually, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. And then you write something else and everyone goes, oh, that was rubbish. What you should have had is a mattress at the bottom of the thing. Oh, I wish I'd gone with it, um, if you know what I mean. So I suppose we do have the choice to accept what's suggested to us or be open to it in the first place, because it may be being suggested to us and we're not hearing it. In being terms... open. Yeah. That's huge, is the... We need, we do need to be open to possibilities. Um, so, and I, and I said that something that 
I feel that you're really good at is helping introduce possibilities. So it's actually, although what you're doing at the moment, it may, because it's so serious in many respects, because you're talking about all sorts of amazing uh, ideas for creating a new way of being, a new way of living and reclaiming our freedom and sovereignty, which nobody's got the right to take away in the first place. So it's we're not really reclaiming it. We're just actually stating that we've got it mm. <laughs> for those who have forgotten it. Um, it's it's it on the one hand it seems to be all very serious but on the other hand it is actually still very creative so i guess maybe the question i want to ask you is what prompted you to go in this direction um i suppose the videos that i were doing was was plateauing and i was getting a bit frustrated because um I, I, on the one hand, the views were plateauing and people didn't seem, seem to be less interested. And I didn't know where to take the channel to sort of develop it and didn't know whether I ought to just do something completely different. Um, not with the channel, but something, ex something else. But I didn't really know what else I could do because I'm, um, I'm a performer. You know, that's the, that's the problem is I want to perform all the time. And I tried getting into television. I'm glad that never happened now, knowing what I know about mainstream television and media and, and all of that. But at the, when I was younger, I wanted to do that. I wanted to direct films and write and, and, and I wanted to make an impact on the world that I felt was changing in the wrong direction. Not that I really thought of it like that then, but I certainly do now. But I knew that I had some, I suppose... Um, what would you call it, feelings for tradition and customs that we were losing. And I wanted to express that through the, the mediums that I was able to do. And I was getting to that point where I was unable to sort of achieve that. And then out of frustration one day, I just happened to comment on something I saw, um, which was a bit left field to the normal stuff that I did, sitting in my armchair, uh, doing a monologue. And it went ballistic and lots and lots of people were talking about it. And, you know, where I was getting, you know, and I was quite sort of happily getting about 5,000 views for a video, which might take a week to achieve. Um, I was getting a, a hundred thousand views and you're just sort of going, Oh my God, people want to talk about this. Previously, I'd tried to talk about those things and people were shutting me down. For goodness sake, don't talk about that. No, that's all conspiracy stuff. You know, you mustn't talk anything about that. Um, but now it was overwhelming that people want, there was a desire to talk about it. So I repeated it a few times and realized, because not only did people want to hear it, but realized that I had stored up in me lots of opinions which i had been expressing but having self-censored i suppose to a degree in the past in order to appease the audience now i was just going well it seems like people are happy to listen i'm just going to say my stuff and then started to interview people um and then that was the sort of opening journey where the rabbit holes opened up and you would and you know when you say rabbit holes um you, i was just listening to what other people said from lots of different disciplines, from people who were talking about money to sovereignty to health to channeling uh, to spiritualism, um, all sorts of different aspects. And the audience were pretty much going along with all of these things, realizing that the world that we have been in was very staid, very controlled, very authoritarian, but and, and very... Um, in a narrow band and there was all this other stuff um, that was known by few and had been suppressed by few that the majority didn't know things like the Telsa stuff and things like that and you know and and, and um, all sorts of things where history had been mucked about with and that you had a suspicion that things weren't right but actually um you suddenly realise, oh my God, that all makes sense. Suddenly it's all like, oh, I've got to get this. And every every um, interviewee would come on and add so much. And I was just going, wow. And I, I said to myself right at the beginning, you've got to be open-minded 
about this. You cannot shut anyone down with their ideas just because you don't agree or you haven't thought of it like that. And that was the biggest lesson, I think, because in the past I would be quite argumentative if somebody said something, well, that doesn't make sense. How can you say that? Whereas now I would just, you know, the, the platform was theirs to make their point and I would step into their shoes. The only time I would question really was to interpret what they were saying for the audience. And half the time it was because I also didn't know, well, what, what do you mean by such and such? Oh, okay, I, I get it now. And uh, so the biggest, and so of course, once you've opened your mind and you start connecting dots and you realize there's more to life than you thought, uh, you can't close it down. You can't go back. You You suddenly go, and that's when the sort of spirituality started to grow out of that. And although I always felt that there was something more um, I couldn't pin it down. I'd been interested in um, the the inner self in the past, but as you get older and you have kids and things, everything else gets on top of you, and you think, oh well, you know, that's just a esoteric thing that doesn't really make much difference. But now, all of a sudden, it makes a hell of a lot of difference. It's just I'm trying to nail it down a bit more now and understand it. I think. You know, listening to you. I wouldn't and... listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> what I what I have a sense of is someone who is very sensitive and has a strong sense of morality to begin with. And that that frustration is the frustration that we feel when there's a it's almost like a sense of indignation when people start mucking about with what's right and what's wrong. And I, I can remember about, I don't know, five, six years ago, I, I, I don't remember what the context was, but I remember being extremely irritated and saying, they're rewriting what the definition of a crime is. Innocently making the observation, not realizing why that was happening. Right that this was very much the <laughs> the route of progress that things were going to take. Um, so it's, it's that sense. And I think that that's one of the reasons why people respond to what you're doing. Because those of us who have a, a moral compass and are sensing that North is becoming South, <laughs> and vice versa we just know that that's wrong mm. oh i agree i mean I, I mean instinctively i think that we all have some element of we know what's right and we know what's wrong uh, and we've been taught a lot of things which aren't isn't really right but it's not too far from right so that we can go along with it but it seems, so there's a lot of sort of gray areas, but I've always been someone who's seen life as black or white. I've been very much in, and I've had to now with this opening of, of the mind be much more accepting, you know, someone would say this is, but I, but if it comes to right and wrong, I know what's wrong. I know what people shouldn't be doing. And um, I'm not saying that I'm able to continually be, um, and not make mistakes or or flounder or uh, do wrong things and and then look back and go oh, I've been such an idiot. I'm more than happy to say that I've been an idiot and I've I've made errors and done very stupid things, um, and, and but learnt from those. At least I hope I hope I've learnt from them. Um, and it's only really by acknowledging that you've made those mistakes that you learn from them. Otherwise, what were they there for? But I've always had, I've, I mean, I've always had my opinions and I don't know where they come from, must come from my parents and my upbringing, I suppose, to a certain degree. Um, and I do, I find it very hard that other people don't share the same, not necessarily the same opinions, I don't mind that, but the same convictions, you know, where some people, you talk about something to somebody and they kind of just shrug and go, well, it's just the way it is. And you go, yeah, but it doesn't have to be the way it is, does it? I mean, if we did this and this, it wouldn't be like that. If we stood up to that, that wouldn't happen. If that's a law, that's the law. If that's, you know, and people just kind of, mm, yeah, I suppose. And you're going, oh, 
Yeah, that's back to learned helplessness that we I was um, mentioning earlier. But just coming back, you know, that that sense of this is wrong and that sense of passion and conviction. Mm. I think one of the things I've noticed is that amongst my clients, the ones who knew immediately that they were being manipulated and that there was something wrong or the ones who've actually known been abused been victimized and they kind of just knew even if they couldn't articulate why they knew that what was happening was wrong and that what is happening is wrong they knew because they recognized it they recognize when somebody is trying to overpower them, manipulate them, belittle them. And they weren't shouting about it, but one thing they knew is that they weren't going to be told what to do. So that that I found fascinating. It's almost like, again, their lives prepared them for what, mm. for, for now. And I, I think for you, that sensitivity that you have comes from having experienced unfairness and injustice. Um, I suppose so. Um, I mean, there's so much in uh, un, injustice and unfairness in the world. Um, I mean, I've had my fair share of issues, but um, I, yeah, I guess so. Um, it, I suppose it's not for me to say, really. Well, it kind of is, because if you're looking at your own life, mm. you can, this is not, you know, there was uh, some ad, and I'm not really a an ad person, but there was an ad that caught my eye a few years ago. Well, a number of years ago now. It was a Red Cross ad. And what they were doing is they were showing earthquakes and they were showing all sorts of, you know, horrible happenings in the world. And then they were juxtaposing it to uh, elderly people alone in their own homes and um, small, what we would consider to be small matters. Um, and they were saying, actually, th there's nothing relative here. It's pain is pain and it's it's all it doesn't matter that it's not a calamity that everybody would recognize it's mm. a person an individual's personal pain and so i think listening to you um and, and i say listening to you because i'm usually washing up <laughs> unless there are something visual that and then i go oh better watch this because um as you as as with everybody, we're all so busy sometimes. So listening to you and watching you when um, when there are visual things that need my attention, I have you, you know you've spoken before about your your childhood. It wasn't easy, and and so I think that does give you that sense of well, this doesn't feel right. This 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 is wrong. Yes, I I I, I mean I guess so. I mean I remember. Um, when my dad was um, suffering from dementia and my sister and I uh, started to look after him pretty much full time over two years and we had to sort of basically stop work and, and just deal with this thing. My sister, uh, who I sort of, well, we both tolerate each other because we're a bit poles apart politically and we've lived quite separately apart from when we were very small. But she reminded me of some of the the issues that um, we had at home that I had not forgotten, forgotten, but I didn't dwell on. But she did dwell on them. She remembered and she had an opinion about our mother, who was an alcoholic, um, and she reminded me of certain things. And one of the things that she reminded me, which I had pushed out of my mind, was that coming back from school, particularly primary school, we would come back from school, we'd walk back together because we both, both went to the school, and there was that moment of dread coming home to see if mum was drunk or not. With the, my, my dad at that point had left home, so it was just mum. 
And I hadn't thought about that until she reminded me, which was about 2017, I think it was, when we had that conversation. And I said, blimey, you know, I hadn't um, thought about that. And that's the, and it all came back and that feeling of dread. And, well, the, it, the feeling of dread was knowing that she was drunk because at first it was like, oh, as soon as you saw, as soon as you should tell. So I, you know, we knew, we just had this, we knew as soon as you saw her, she was drunk. And and then the evening would go downhill and wasn't very pleasant. Uh, and we would just get out as much as we could and and stay away. Um, and so we dealt, you know, you, as kids, you just deal with what you've been dealt with. You get on with it. Uh, but I hadn't, um, so I had clearly pushed that out and had a bit more of, I'd chosen to remember the, the finer times, the more fun <laughs> sister seemed to have remembered many more of the instances that weren't very positive. And so we would talk about that and I would say, God, oh, blimey, yeah, that's true. I hadn't thought about that either or that or now you mention it. And it started to fill in the blanks, I suppose, because I'm generally a, um, a half full kind of guy and I don't like to dwell on the bad things. I much rather, much rather concentrate on the on the good things and, and be optimistic. But it was fascinating to to know that. So I suppose you do get to know when things aren't right because you've you've had a, a sense. And of course, you. I mean, I interviewed a chap on my channel um, who was Polish, who is still is Polish, I suppose, is Polish all his life. Um, and he, he was around when the Berlin Wall came down and the government collapsed where he was in Poland for a bit. And then martial law came in and he was saying, I recognise, and you hear this from certain people in Eastern Europe about things that are going on over in this country, if they're living here, they say, I recognised the signs well before anybody else recognised that things weren't right because we lived through it before and we know, oh, that's a state of dictatorship. That's not the people deciding. That's somebody else. So they've known all that. And, and he was telling me about this. And I thought, wow, that's really interesting because a lot of us over here have just been slowly, slowly boiled like the frog and not really noticed. But he knew the moment the gas went on, and the water was, you know, not even warm. And so I suppose if you have had things happen to you in the past, as you say, and you've suffered in a different way, your antennae is more alert to it. Exactly. And that's that's what I, I feel with you is that 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 this is that sensitivity is linked with your intuition and that you that also combines with the sense of knowing that that conviction of knowing what's right and don't knowing what's wrong um because you've kind of been there at a personal level mm. it's um i think one of the things that really is very valuable in watching you is is having that sense of care and conviction that comes from you and i think this is the that whole part of the spiritual journey of opening up as well, opening up your mind and going, okay, so what else is there? What is that possibility? And the optimism that you bring is, honestly, Richard, it's like soft rain on parched ground sometimes because it is so easy for us to fall into despair. Mm. Here you come along and go, Oh, by the way, um, here's this person and they're talking about healing. And have you ever thought about healing in this way? And people, and you just go, oh, really? Maybe I don't have to be in pain anymore or it's so much anymore. There are other views. There are other alternatives and practical solutions to the many dilemmas that, are, that we're being bombarded with at, at this moment in time. So that optimism combined with your antenna has created, I think, something very special um, for us. So I guess maybe um, the next question would be, what, what do you feel is, is happening 
at a more spiritual level do you feel that maybe we're moving towards something better that this is an opportunity um do you feel that um perhaps there is because people have talked about this as a as a kind of spiritual war what do you feel i well um let me just go back a bit because when first of all people were talking about it being a spiritual war or, or a spirituality at all 15 months ago, I sort of had my own ideas of what, who I was or what I wasn't, you know, as in flesh and blood and 3D worlds and things, but I hadn't really put language to it. And I spoke to Julia, my girlfriend, when we were, when more people were saying, oh, it's a spiritual journey, you know, people were, on the channel were talking about this spirituality, or I'd get emails saying, oh, it's a spiritual battle, and, you know, it's a this, that, and the other. And I had to turn to her, I said, what the hell are they, what are they talking about? Because what, I said to her, what actually is spirituality? Because I had in my mind this word completely separate to what I think most of your viewers would understand it to be, because to me, it was this, Victorian seance spirituality of ectoplasm and uh, bells ringing and and all of this and I had that concept as a as what it was um, the concept of me as a a, a, a lifeless be a nameless spirit if for want of a better word or consciousness as a completely different type of thing. I thought, well, there's this spiritualist church and people go there and and do all of this. And, and you know, you see these pictures in, from the 1900s of people with cotton wool coming out of their mouths and talking about this ectoplasm. And you kind of, with, they don't talk about that very much these days, do they? Maybe there's a, a shortage of cotton wool or something. Um, and Harry Houdini, who was trying to go around and um, say all this was all false and, and all of that because his mother didn't come back and things like that. Um, so I didn't really understand what the spiritual bit was. And then so when you come into this spiritual wall about war, about whether it's it's good and evil and things are happening in the in a in a thing, I still struggle with that sense. And every now and again, I'll hear people say, oh, um, I mean, as we know, there's problems in the Middle East. And I was on a Zoom call the other day and somebody said, oh, well, we've, we've all been meditating to hope it will get better. And then there's part of me that's going, well, what's that going to do? <laughs> but then there's the other part of me sort of going, well, if everything is spiritual if everything isn't real if this is all a hologram if everything is you know thought or consciousness then when of course that's making a difference and so i'm at this point where i'm trying desperately to on the one hand accept something which i can't grasp whilst on the other hand grasping stuff and trying to say that's not there <laughs> So it's um it's it's the battle is to try and understand to me what this what this really means because also the other thing with a battle is that there's at least two sides and I'm and I keep hearing about oh well it's satanist this or luciferians or dark forces and all of this and there's part of me that thinks but like electricity you have a force that you can either plug in and light a light up or you can plug in into an electric chair and kill someone. You can use the same force for good and evil. It's not the force, it's not the electricity's at fault, it's the people utilising it. And so is it the spiritual bit that's the bad bit or is it the people who are, as it were, doing bad things using that? So I... Yeah, so on my sort of spirituality, you know, battle of that, I'm I'm still I'm you know well away from coming to an understanding, and that's and that's a problem for me. It, it is a problem for I think all of us as we try to make sense of, of life, or where I say all of us, I think most of us probably, because what what we want is we want to have things that are tangible which makes sense and 
when we start talking about energy and frequency, it's so much harder. It makes sense because obviously electricity is is energy, and we we you know we know that it exists, and we also know we we've got instruments that are seeing things that we couldn't see before. Um, there's just there's a lot that science is catching up with in terms of things that people have believed for a very long time. So it's making it easier to, to imagine that um, meditation actually can have an impact. And we know there's been studies that have shown that that's the case with people sending out, you know, high frequency um, thoughts, as in really positive, positive thoughts can actually affect change. There's been lots of studies that have shown this. So we're beginning to catch up with that, but, but still, this is the plight of the human being that we are in this physical world and we know that there's more to it, but sometimes it's hard to believe it. Um, and yet there can be evidence all around in very subtle ways. The thing that, the thing that um, I suppose confuses me or, or challenges me is that we know that say gravity is something you can't see it's it's a i mean people are debating now whether that's a force or not now and you know you get all these sort of weird arguments but you know that if you uh, you, you know you, you know it's a force that happens so that you can drop a pen mm. and every time you do it, it it it's not like once in a blue moon and you know reports have shown that these particular Indian people or this natives have sat around and they've managed to drop a pen and it's actually falling. It happens every time. Same with electricity being a force. It's not like, again, a bunch of Eskimos somewhere have have, have done something rather magic and they've got a light bulb to come up when they flick a switch. And, and yet with the sort of things like manifestation and positive thoughts and things, it does seem incredibly hit and miss and sometimes it may work and sometimes it may not and then if it did work was that coincidence or was that really the thought is that you know now there may be on your channel many people who can do these things just like turning electricity on and off um but it's it's harder to to tune in and believe something when it's not consistent in the same way that dropping a pen down is if you say what I mean I think that actually most people that I speak to would say that it takes a long time to develop consistency and I, I can remember um, I think it was last year I one of my my guests talking about years of meditation before anything interesting happened <laughs> and I thought wow that's perseverance um, so, and I, and it's, it's a bit like, you know, when we were talking about inspiration, sometimes it's there and sometimes it isn't. Mm. And it, a lot of it also has to do with our frame of mind, because if everything is energy and our energy is low, then it's going to be much harder for us to, let's say, reach greater heights. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, I agree. I, absolutely. If you're in a, if you're in a low frame of mind, then even inspiration takes a bit of time to come. And it's the same, it's the same principle, it's the same idea. So I think one of the things that I has drawn me to you is this understanding that we we've lost something that we need to reconnect to. Um, whether it's it's nature, whether it's a greater sense of divinity whatever it is. And I feel that, I guess I, I, I'm talking about natural law in a sense, again, where it's this sense of, okay, this is, I feel in my, in my very, the essence of my being, that there is a right and a wrong. And so I, these are principles that I do not wish to live by because they are harmful to humanity, to nature. Um, and that I think is a very, it, that is a spiritual path. When we start to recognize 
that we are as a collective moving in the in a direction that breaks natural law in stating do no harm and actually do you know what i i i'm realizing that this this is harmful it's not it's not this benign thing that i've been told it is and i've been kind of edging off the path and i want to come back on there so that that's one of the things that i that has drawn me to you is seeing that that process happening with you yes well um i certainly feel that we've lost our way dramatically um and we've lost our way in um I mean, for me, for me, we've lost our way in the, in the fact that we have put everything into um, big companies, big corporations, um, that no longer people are in control of themselves. They're being manipulated and um, the authoritarian way of doing things. Um, a big thing for me and where we've lost, I mean, to me, the last hundred years has been an interesting experiment uh, but I wouldn't want to repeat it. And, I and I'd like the experiment to finish, thanks very much. I'd like to go back to, say, just before the First World War and say, OK, let's not have the war. Let's, uh, let's let people like Tesla, who was coming up with some amazing healing techniques um, and energy ideas, let, let him carry on those developments. Um, let's keep the family unit together. Let's eat together. Let's grow food together i mean people used to grow food people used to have um one or two animals you know they'd have a cow or a pig you know going a bit, bit further back uh people were very much more responsible for themselves um and their family men knew who they were women knew who they weren't i'm not saying that women have to go back into the kitchen and just uh, you know cook again but as a family unit the, the roles that we had played important part we could develop those um we've lost we've lost that i mean it's so much about the, taking back responsibility we've gone down the easy path we've allowed technology to make things convenient so we don't have to bother anymore um i worry now with things like ai because i think people just will except things like chat gtp which is online as the new guru and you and you whereas you see i'm a great reader and i like to read a book and i like to know who wrote the book and if i disagree with certain things i could then maybe not read the book by that author again or challenge myself to read that book but knowing that it's from that author with chat gtp that might be scavenging from all sorts of different places I've no idea where the information comes from, but it comes out black and white as if it's an authority on whatever subject you put in. And bits of it may be right, bits of it may not be right. Some of it may be completely biased, depending on who programmed the thing. But you've got no references. And uh, But I worry that the next generation have been so stupefied that they just go, well, chat GPT, I mean, chat, you know, we do it already with you go, well, Wikipedia says this about such and such. And we know that that's all manipulated. Mainstream media, BBC says that we should have a medical intervention and uh, we should, that's the only way to be healthy because uh, certain things um, are, are good for you. And it turns out that certain things are not actually good for you, but people are being manipulated by these things. I think we've lost that responsibility to think for ourselves. We've trained children to be obedient slaves, you know, so that they have to put their hand up just to, to go and have permission to have a biological function, like, you know, emptying the bladder, which should be an ordinary thing. They're being trained to go into a certain type of profession rather than working with their parents. Um, they're being given toys and so, you know, you can have a play cooking stove rather than actually have a go on the real stove. And, oh, yeah, did you burn your fingers? That's because fire's hot. You won't do it again because you've learned. You've learned by doing things. Oh, did it burn? Maybe you took your attention away from it for a few minutes. You have to watch that milk. Otherwise, it will come over the top when you bought. You know, kids will learn that. But when they're, they know, I think kids know that they've been fobbed off 
with plastic imitation less, you know, that even the toys aren't as strong as the real things that they're supposed to be playing with. Obviously, you couldn't give a kid a, a racing car when he's three, a real racing car, because that, you know, there's, there's obviously a certain amount of uh, common sense that goes into this. But kids want to help. And when you, you know, if you, I mean, I've had kids, I've had three of them. And when you gave them jobs around the house, when they were very young, they were very keen to go, oh, I'll put the stuff in the washing machine. And can I put the powder in? And, you know, parent, oh, no, no, I better do that because it's a certain amount of powder. You suddenly you're limiting them. And it's like, no, no, you can put the powder in. Yeah, that's it. Oh, blimey, it's, a, it's a lot of powder. We might have a few soap suds there, but you, you know, you and the kids learn together. I think that, responsibility has been taken away that worldly wise information the 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 nature of things of of knowing that plant i mean who knows the names of grasses and trees and plants these days no but you know kids don't know they don't have no notion they might know oh that's a that stings me yeah that's a stinging nettle i mean they don't need to know the latin names of these things but they might want to know that that's dog wart or or that's colt's foot or something, you know, but they have no notion of any of that. Um, and there's so much of the natural world. I mean, food, food is the thing. Where, what is a chicken? No, it's that thing that, that comes from a certain fast food restaurant. Yeah, but where does that come from? Oh, I don't, well, it's a chicken, is it? It comes from a farm, I think. Yeah, what does it look like? Oh, I don't know. Does, does a chicken have feathers? Oh, does it have feathers? I mean, you know, this last hundred years, and particularly after the Second World War, to me, is is the is the most terrible time that humanity's gone through. We're, we're challenging genders, for goodness sake. We're challenging so many things. And maybe we have to go through this so that we can realise we will never do this again. And maybe that's, you know, that's part of it. And I do feel that at 60, that I am, I was born at a time when I still had plenty of time in the analog world, knowing what things were. Yeah. Whereas now uh, I can see that the the the, um, the problems with digital world and this world of screens and things, and you could respect a certain amount of it, which I do try to, but the youngsters don't know that respect. They don't know when too much is too much it's it's that that is all there is they don't know what a chicken is they they've not cooked a meal from scratch before they don't know how to survive we've dumbed them down so to me we've lost so much of the natural thing and the and just to finish this bit is to say that actually when you go back to the most simplest things like i don't know but making a casserole, which is what I've thrown together and is in the oven whilst we're recording this. It's, it's A, it's so easy, but it's just so much more fun. And if you can do it with your son or daughter of a certain age and you're, and you're doing those things together or with your partner, I mean, Julia and I will turn the electricity off in the evening and have a few candles and we'll have a, um, our our wood burning range which is how we cook which all sounds very grand when you paint it like that but my house is very very basic really and we stripped it right back to the very simple things and I will read aloud to her or she will read to me and we don't need television we don't need other people's opinions we talk to one another we cook together we eat together and the rewards in that are you know people will go oh my god what a boring life it's so not and that's what makes it magical. Um, obviously, if you're on your own, it's not it's not quite the same. But um, when I am on my own, I love to read and I'll read in low light by the fire and I'll go for a walk. I'll meditate. I'll ruminate. I'll think of things. And um, it's th the simplest things are free. And that's you know what we've we've forgotten to appreciate as well sorry that was a very long diatribe on very hackneyed cliche things but they're hackneyed and cliche for a reason because they're meaningful they're not hackneyed and cliched uh it, with what you're describing is the very thing that i was saying this is in and of itself a a spiritual i guess um development within you this understanding that 
we have strayed and become divided from nature and you know guest after guest after guest after guest on this on this uh, program we we talk about the the ways in which we are we are divorced from nature and how that's happened over centuries really and the reason why we're in so much trouble is precisely because of that and and the path to reconnection i think is one of the key elements of going going forward in a much more positive way and so it's about reconnection with nature and of course the other thing that you talk about a lot is the need for community and so th th here we are again you, just the need to to gather to be together and to to help each other to create community so i guess i've invited you here because uh i wanted to thank you for your ruminations, your guests, and for bringing alternatives to what is being offered to, to us. The, and I think that that's immensely valuable. Thank and you. thank you for your wonderful work. Well, that's very kind. It's very kind of you. I feel a bit uh, um, humbled there by that, but um, I, I mean, you, it, it is all very important, um, and I can only speak from my heart, I suppose, on the subjects that I talk about. But thank you so much. It's been it's been lovely to be on on your show. So, Richard, thank you so much for your time today. If people want to find you, how do they do that? Um, well, I suppose YouTube is the best place to find me, which is um, Richard Vobes, my name, at Richard Vobes. There is a website, which is richardvobes.com, um, but YouTube is the main the main source. And uh, all, sorts, um, all sorts will come up when you put my name in. Well, I'll be putting a link to those in the description box. Thank you so much, Richard. My pleasure. Thank you for asking me. And thank you all for watching. Next time, we're going to continue on this theme of developing our way of connecting with each other because we're going to be looking at kindness. Until then, goodbye.